welcome to the November seminar of the Entangled Political Economy uh, Research Network. Uh, today we will hear a presentation by Michaela Novak. Um, but before I introduce uh, Michaela, I'm just gonna go over the rules really quick, just because we always have different people on the call and some of you have seen it five times and some of you haven't seen it, seen it at all. So this is also from the email that I, um, that I send out, but basically <clears throat> we go for 80 minutes so that you have time to get to your the next the next appointment. Um, we I will take about five minutes with the introduction. Then uh, Michaela, uh, hello Roger, you have a lot of feedback. Hi, how you doing? I'm I'm in the airport on a uh, mm -hmm. on a flight, but okay. so you can't see me, but I'm here. I'm listening. Okay, great. For a, for a moment, we heard a lot of noise coming out of, uh, from you, but... Uh, oh, I'll try to mute. Yeah, sorry. No, no problem. No, we, we're happy to have you. Anyway, so um, uh, 80 minutes, 25 minutes for the presentation, the rest for discussion. Um, you've read the paper, you know that. And then uh, the only thing that is kind of different from last year is that uh, we will form the queue at the end of the presentation, right? So chat is great, but we I don't I'm not gonna refer to the chat until after we get all the all the questions from the from the group uh, live. Um, okay, and now um, for our presenters, so Michaela Novak, she will speak on the dramat dramaturgical Wagner attention and persuasion in entangled political economy. Um, Michaela Novak is a doctoral student in sociology at the Australian National University. Uh, in Canberra, but she also has a PhD in economics for RM, RMIT. Um, she has published uh, numerous journal article, articles on a variety of uh, topics in economics and sociology, uh, inequality, cryptocurrencies, uh, social movements, and, and so on. Uh, and she already has published two books. Um, the 2018 is the book on inequality, where she takes a network approach to inequality. It's a very unique uh, perspective on, uh, on that uh, contentious issue. And then her most recent uh, publication that uh, this year is the Freedom in, uh, in Contention, which is basically an analysis of the, of the emergence of social movements, also taking the entangled network um, approach. So uh, with that, uh, Michaela, thank you for uh, taking the time to, to present your, your paper. And uh, the, screen is, the screen is yours and I will be. Well, thank you um, very much, um, Marta. I appreciate uh, the very warm welcome, and I'm uh, certainly very appreciative of um, all of you uh, attending uh, today from uh, various uh, corners and reaches of uh, the world. Uh, as uh, as uh, uh, indicated by Marta, I'm speaking to you from uh, Canberra, Australia. It's about 6.30 a.m., and... Uh, uh, hopefully uh, the noise of the, um, the eastern coel bird doesn't uh, annoy you uh, too much. We have a sort of a uh, haunting sort of sound of a bird in my close proximity. And this is a, a migratory species that travels basically 3,000 kilometres, like from Papua New Guinea to southern Australia during summer to, uh, to, uh, to roost and so on. So hopefully uh, the, the noise of that creature doesn't disturb us uh, too much. So... Um, uh, so once again, thank you uh, very much for the uh, for the invitation, um, and also um, a warm welcome uh, to Dick Wagner, who's uh, with us today. So uh, the purpose of my presentation is to sort of uh, outline uh, the key themes of what I'd call, you know, either a working paper or even a provocation uh, paper, which attempts to uh, sort of extend. Uh, a theme that, uh, that has a certain degree of commonality within uh, sort of Wagner's uh, treatment of entangled political economy, and that is his metaphorical uh, descriptions of entanglement as imbuing the qualities of a drama, and that drama metaphorically taking place uh, on some kind of uh, societal uh, stage. Um, I think this, I've always found uh, this description, this metaphorical description of societal interaction to be quite uh, fascinating. So I thought I would take the opportunity now to uh, look more deeply uh, into this uh, and to, to see if there are opportunities for uh, extension, drawing upon uh, pre-existing 
uh, theories from sociology, psychology, and other uh, disciplines that might uh, come to the aid of uh, sort of providing a more sort of a comprehensive or fulsome uh, explanation. So um, allow me to just uh, make a start by uh, provi providing an understanding of what um, a metaphor uh, actually uh, is. I think it's quite important to uh, just provide this contextualization for uh, it, it is often times the case that uh, metaphors are often taken uh, too literally. Uh, for example, even in this sort of conception of society uh, as a drama, uh, some scholars such as K Kenneth Burke uh, and his uh, sociological, anthropological conception of dramatism, he actually uh, regards uh, the idea of drama literally uh, as a description of society, whereas um, I don't believe that uh, Wagner does, but uh, it's important to let's to just understand what we're uh, describing when we're referring to the, uh, the metaphor of drama. So as you can see on the slide, uh, a metaphor is a figure of speech in which a word or phrase uh, denoting uh, some one kind of object or action is used in the place of another, suggesting a likeness or analogy between them. And the, a metaphor uh, which is applied to economic, political, social phenomena, and it regularly is applied uh, to such phenomena, uh, not only serves a comparative function comparing uh, one likeness with another, um, but I think it also helps to illuminate aspects or attributes of behavior and conduct that may not otherwise be comprehended. And I think the value of the drama metaphor uh, in entangled political economy uh, seriously adds to uh, the overall distinctiveness of this uh, substrand of research in contrast specifically to um, uh, neoclassical economic uh, descriptions of human agency, which tend to be rather mechanical and robotic. And as you'll find out by reading uh, my provocation paper and absorbing these slides, you'll uh, hopefully uh, understand that uh, the, the value of the dramatic metaphor is that uh, it, it, it sort of enriches uh, our understandings of the domains of uh, sort of human action over and beyond uh, what, uh, what is typically portrayed under neoclassical uh, political economy, even the additive styles subject to the EPE critique, entangled political economy being EPE, of course. Um, so over the centuries, scholars have certainly embraced the metaphor of society as an improvisational drama uh, where individuals play the part of actors within the broader setting of society as a stage. Uh, the reason why I have an asterisk uh, next to uh, this particular point is that I have some additional notes, which I'll just uh, recite for you. Um, so I talk about drama. I just want to briefly describe what I mean by drama. So it's essentially a mode of uh, largely fictional or exclusively fictional representation through dialogue and performance. Specifically, it is a composition in verse or prose intended to, to portray life or character or to tell a story. And it usually involves conflicts and emotions through action and dialogue. And this is quite important, I think, from an entangled political economy perspective. And it's typically uh, designed to uh, for a theatrical performance, right? So uh, drama and theater are interlinked. Um, the no this notion of drama is oftentimes actually generalized to represent a state, a situation, or a series of events which involve interesting or intense conflict of forces or a situation characterized by a dramatic state, effect, or quality. Uh, and as a final note about what I mean by drama, the term is actually derived from uh, various ancient Greek words referring to an act or a play or to take or to take action. Uh, the two iconic masks of drama 
the laughing face and the crying face are the symbols of two of the ancient Greek muses, Thalia, the muse of comedy, and Melpomene, the muse of tragedy. And so uh, one, once more, I just want to uh, convey this notion that uh, my understanding of the uh, use of drama is metaphorical uh, in an entangled political economy um, uh, uh, context. Uh, it, it contrasts a literal description of society as a drama that is performed on a stage of human coexistence. For example, uh, Kenneth Burke's uh, model of dramatism, which I think was uh, devised originally uh, in the late 60s. Okay. So, uh, I, so the purpose of this slide is just to reinforce uh, the, the, the heritage of the use of uh, the drama metaphor to describe uh, kinds of human action, interaction in society. Uh, you see here uh, two, uh, two figures. You see obviously on the left, uh, Adam Smith, and on the right, you see the figure of a youthful uh, sociologist, Irving uh, Goffman, uh, who, uh, whose uh, work uh, is uh, synonymous with uh, the, the modern uh, sociological treatment of society and human interaction as a drama. So um, Adam Smith uh, is actually well known and identified for the, his use of dramatic um, and theatrical uh, metaphors of society. And indeed, if uh, you, for example, if you read some of the work of Sarah Squire, uh, you'll understand that uh, Smith actually uh, had a quite a broad interest uh, in the study of uh, theatre. It is speculated that uh, there was an unpublished uh, manuscript uh, that Smith prepared with respect to the, the study of the theatre, which was uh, burned um, at his request on, on his passing. Um, so what I would like to just do briefly, uh, uh, time allowing, is just to, uh, just to convey a bit more of a deeper understanding of uh, the sort of theatrical uh, quality of um, Adam Smith's concept of the self and uh, moral psychology. So uh, as you would be well aware, a key conceptual construct in Smith's theory of moral sentiments is his notion of the impartial spectator, a hypothetical figure supposed to govern individual actions by granting or withholding fellow feeling or sympathy. Uh, Smith posited an impartial spectator that views and appraises one's own situation and conduct. As Smith himself explained, and I quote, we endeavor to judge our conduct as we imagine any other fair an impartial spectator would examine it. So the operation of the impartial spectator encourages us to moderate our passions in order to create a harmony and concord with the emotions of those who are watching us. Uh, Smith anticipates that as a result, individuals develop a capacity for self-command, you know, to the extent that people use their impartial spectators to moderate their passions. Uh, this serves a useful function of deterring a given individual from injuring others for their own advantage by reminding them of the contempt and indignation of others warranted by uh, such egregious behaviour. Now, the, the impartial spectator is typically seen as a uh, dispassionate uh, construct of the psychological self that moderates the display of passions, as I've indicated. But um, as David Marshall and um, many others have actually pointed out, uh, Smith's concept contains dramatic elements. So the first point for me to make is that the impartial spectator is a spectator. Our own actions are not only subject to appraisals by our own uh, internal uh, moral guidance, but we appear before other people who have developed similar senses of impartial spectatorship. The manner in which people face each other in the world and their modes of conduct, conduct critically appraised introduces, uh, I would argue, a theatrical dimension to social interaction. Smith, for example, writes the fear 
the individual's face and impairing before the eyes of potentially uh, unsympathetic spectators. So there's a quality of suspense that comes with drama. With this spectatorum at the heart of moral experience considered to feature dramatic qualities. Um, a number of scholars have um, also indicated, though, that uh, Smith's interest in, in interpersonal drama enacted on the metaphorical stage of society is consistent with the broad tenor of Enlightenment period scholarship in political economy. Uh, refer specifically to the work by Agnew, which is uh, contained in the reference list of my working paper. That, that said, though, um, other metaphors have certainly been detected in Adam Smith's works, including, interestingly enough, uh, machine metaphors to describe uh, certain kinds of economic activity, which might have been speculatively, uh, but, uh, but nonetheless partially inspired by the onset of Newtonian physics. Uh, a potential line of future inquiry, I think, is to make assessments of the balance between uh, those varying metaphorical alternatives in Smith's work, uh, the theatre versus the machine. So uh, as I say on this slide, um, Adam Smith, uh, Adam Smith's influence, especially in uh, sociology and social psychology, I, I think has been quite horrendously neglected uh, nowadays, but there is no question at all to my mind uh, that uh, Smith's uh, notion of the impartial spectator and his broader moral psychology are uh, very much uh, influenced early American sociologists such as Charles Cooley, who coined a concept of the looking glass self and uh, quite intriguingly and, and very relevantly, uh, I feel for the study in modern political economy, a concept of what he calls sympathetic introspection. Uh, look it up if you have time. And also uh, George Mead, who refers to a concept of the generalized other. Uh, and these uh, refine these theoretical refinements uh, traceable in early American sociology uh, do bear the Smithian images of dramatic imaginings of self uh, as a self interacts with others. Okay, so um, as I've uh, briefly mentioned, uh, the, the drama metaphor in modern times is most closely associated with uh, the figure of Irving Goffman. Now, um, he's a very multifaceted and versatile uh, scholar, and, uh, and I think the, uh, the multi multifaceted nature of his scholarship means that it's sometimes difficult to sort of, uh, sort of pin down uh, um, sort of the, uh, the sort of uh, uh, the, the dramatic metaphor in a finely grained uh, manner. His scholarship was exclu exclusively qualitative uh, in nature. And he also attended to exclusively a micro level metaphorical account of dramatic uh, interactions. So uh, Goffman's theory, uh, the main uh, works uh, never really attempted to explain uh, sort of social and uh, other um, aspects of human behavior at a meso or a sort of a macro uh, level. This is uh, for Goffman, uh, exclusively a metaphorical project that attends to everyday uh, encounters, uh, primarily face-to-face -face encounters uh, between people, though uh, Goffman's scholarship has been extended to uh, consider uh, the dramatic element of social media, which uh, seems to be uh, quite, quite a prevalent uh, mode of um, sort of behavior um, that is un understood uh, during this time. So, um, sort of Goffman sort of refers to uh, a dramatic element of human interaction uh, on a metaphorical stage of society. And he uh, introduces a range of uh, concepts uh, that are quite relevant to the understanding of this dr drama metaphor. Uh, he uh, emphasizes the importance of uh, that, that individuals subscribe in terms of maintaining good public impressions, right? So people will engage uh, in actions in order to uh, maintain uh, face uh, and a good public impression. Uh, people will engage uh, in these sort of dramatic performances interactionally 
uh, on a front stage of society. Uh, he demarcates various positions in the theatre of society as being a front stage where you know people are actually engaging in public encounters with one another. Then there are sort of various off stages and back stages where uh, people relax uh, and um, uh, may potentially divulge their true feelings about uh, their public impressions to uh, their close friends, their intimates, uh, and so on. Um, and another important uh, complementary strand of understanding drama uh, from the Goffman perspective is that consistent with people striving to maintain good public impressions of themselves in the face of others, um, uh, individuals consistent with that uh, seek to avoid uh, embarrassment um, uh, or almost at all costs, depending on the situation. Now, uh, Goffman was hugely influential uh, in sociology and remains uh, to, to this day in, in teaching uh, undergraduate students as I have for the past couple of years. Uh, Goffman is one of these key go-to figures that uh, young scholars learn uh, in the first instance. Uh, however, intri and intriguingly, um, I, I guess perhaps because of his sort of non-formalist approach to scholarship, um, there has been a quite limited engagement, as I notice, uh, by uh, most political economists towards Goffman. Um, I hope that my paper, my working paper, represents a sort of a modest contribution uh, towards sort of bringing in uh, what I think are some of the relevant uh, sort of features of Goffman's work uh, to an understanding of economic political interactions. Okay, so um, I want to sort of convey um, a, a, an idea that, um, that various scholars, um, you know, especially in the immediate decades following Goffman, uh, had seriously engaged uh, with this uh, concept of um, uh, the metaphor of uh, drama. Uh, certainly in the period from the 1960s through, I'm, I'm, I'm basically discerning roughly until the 80s, there have been several branches of uh, social science that have advanced models of affective um, or symbolic uh, politics, which, uh, which explicitly try to bring in uh, the, 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 the proposition that uh, sort of political activity, uh, uh, sort of political, you know, sort of physical gesturing by political figures, uh, the use of symbols by political figures like flags and statues and, um, and rituals such as political ceremonies, uh, and even the use of various what we call material props or non-material symbolic props um, are used to uh, sort of shape um, the, the affective state of a population, which might be convenient uh, for political actors in terms of their re-election prospects. Um, so to think about affective or symbolic politics, I refer to uh, several key names, including Merrillman, Edelman, uh, Peter Hall, Victor Turner, uh, 1982 book, and uh, Tahart. Uh, so there, there, there is the, a, a continuing carriage of um, this uh, sort of dramaturgic uh, scholarship in the understanding, especially of political phenomena. Now, intriguingly for me, um, uh, Dick Wagner had asked in a, a 2018 paper, which appears in, so I'm just looking towards my bookcase, um, uh, in a 2018, a chapter in a contributed chapter in a 2018 book, uh, entitled Buchanan's Tensions. I think this was edited by um, Peter Becky and Solomon Stein. And in this very intriguing chapter, which I would encourage you to look at, um, uh, Wagner is uh, rhetorically asking, um, what, what, uh, how would uh, public choice scholarship transpire if Buchanan actually systematized um, uh, early Italian uh, fiscal sociology and political sociology and, uh, and more broadly uh, sort of political theories um, that emphasize the existence of ruler elites. Um, and I think a sort of shorthand uh, partial response to that question from me would be 
uh, essentially you'll see more papers along the lines of what you see that I screen grabbed here on the screen. So you'll actually see uh, if public choice scholarship uh, took uh, more seriously or took embraced as more central uh, to its core, uh, the, the idea of uh, elite theory and uh, sort of political uh, and fiscal sociology, you'll actually see much more scholarship which attends to this um, idea that, um, uh, that uh, sort of politicians will uh, engage or political actors more broadly will engage uh, in uh, sort of dramatic performances in order uh, to uh, sort of mobilize um, the public politically and also uh, assist political actors, political candidates in their re-election prospects. Um, but having said that, uh, to some extent, of course, uh, various what I call non-rational actor frameworks of public choice have actually um, been presented uh, in scholarship. And these do employ in, in, in various senses this, these dramatic themes that I'm starting to refer to. For example, we can think of uh, expressive uh, voting, which is a particular specialization of Jeff Brennan. Um, and I'm also very intrigued, uh, and I think there's plenty of um, uh, research opportunity to pick up on some of the early scholarship of Tyler Cowan um, and others with respect to political conduct being uh, centered upon, upon fame seeking or legacy seeking, um, um, complementing uh, sort of uh, instrumentalist strategies that seek to maximize voter share. Um, the, so this idea of human interaction as entailing some dramatic quality is, is also traceable in, in, in an uh, allied scholarship. Uh, so I refer to uh, John Hartley and Jason Potts uh, they have a fascinating two, 2014 book uh, entitled Culture Science, in which uh, they refer uh, very prominently uh, to the use of narratives and storytelling uh, as a way of um, sort of ensuring uh, collective buy-in to uh, certain uh, sort of projects of a collect collective action nature um, and uh, also sort of, uh, sort of uh, galvanizing emotional bonds uh, with, within groups as well. And I also wish to refer you to a very fascinating book, a recent book by uh, Tossie and Warmke um, called Moral Grandstanding. They have a chapter in there uh, referring to, uh, very intriguingly and consistent with this uh, line of thought that I'm uh, conveying to you, um, uh, of politics as a moral pageantry. Um, very fascinating uh, sort of use of uh, metaphor, which they uh, get into. And so uh, if you're interested in these sort of dimensions, I encourage you uh, to also investigate uh, Tossie and uh, Warmke's uh, scholarship as well. Okay, uh, to move on, um, I now sort of, uh, I now wish to explicitly uh, raise uh, the, the uh, the extent to which uh, the, the drama metaphor has been adopted in entangled political economy scholarship. Now, if you uh, read uh, a range of uh, Dick Wagner's major works, especially his books, uh, but not exclusively so, you'll find uh, several passages within each uh, research output that refers to um, either in passing or in, in greater detail, this idea of um, entangled human interactivity as embodying a quality of a societal drama, a cosmic drama, or an improvisational uh, cosmic uh, drama. Um, and I, it's very intriguing that, um, that Wagner uh, situates this metaphorical discussion within a um, broader analysis that considers uh, the, 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 the the transitional positionality of node actors in networks. And so what I specifically mean by this is that uh, Wagner uh, uses this idea of a drama uh, to refer to essentially the alteration of the position of characters as stagehands that help to order, if not condition society. Uh, whereas 
fairly much prior to the 20th century and as reflected in uh, Schumpeter's scholarship about uh, the entrepreneurship being the key character of uh, implicated in economic change in society. Um, uh, prior to the 20th century, we see the, the stagehands of uh, the, the human drama as being essentially represented by commercial entrepreneurs. Um, however, uh, as a result of um, you know, various uh, sort of historical and economic and legal and other factors, uh, we have seen, uh, according to uh, Wagner, um, a transition actually in the positionality of these stagehands where the commercial entrepreneurs have been removed and as, as the scope and size of government has increased during the 20th century, uh, largely tied to the instantiation of the progressivist regulatory and fiscal agendas, uh, we now see these stagehands um, increasingly being represented by governmental actors. So legislators, bureaucrats, and um, these particular actors are now increasingly taking on um, the, the role of um, ordering society, uh, contemporary society as, as it stands. Um, a really nice uh, example of this in Entangled Political Economy scholarship uh, is reflected in Wagner's discussion about the, the, the alterations in uh, the credit markets um, owing to uh, the, 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 the growing prevalence of regulation um, in the determination of the allocation and distribution of uh, finance. Okay, um, I also want to point to um, a, a brief but particularly interesting uh, sort of use of the dramatic metaphor in uh, Wagner's uh, work. Uh, I think this is primarily sourced from um, your uh, 2010 book, uh, Dick, uh, uh, Mind, Society and Human Action, where you refer to um, a, a dramatic element in economic entrepreneurship. And uh, so, so the, the point I'm making here is that the dramatic metaphor not exclusively applies to politics. Um, there is a sense in which uh, so this dr dramatic metaphor can apply uh, even to the operation of commercial enterprises and entrepreneurship with, which give rise to that. And what I'm referring to particularly is um, the, 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 the need for entrepreneurs uh, to try to solicit finances from financial institutions and others. So, uh, so Dick uh, briefly refers to uh, the presentation of business plans um, and uh, meetings where entrepreneurs, aspiring entrepreneurs that seek finance, have to engage in dramatic persuasion uh, to potential creditors uh, in order to procure uh, finance. And what's, um, what's very interesting for me uh, from this um, brief discussion by Wagner is that there is actually um, uh, quite a considerable um, amount of scholarly literature behind that. Uh, which actually refers to this dramatic quality uh, attached to economic entrepreneurship. I particularly commend in this context a, um, a paper which is referred, uh, a paper which is cited in the, my working paper by Anderson uh, and also by Monica Lindgren as well. So those uh, readings are in the working paper for your interest. And they, and they actually in, introduce this dramatic metaphor uh, into, uh, into uh, economic entrepreneurship. Now, as I've said though, uh, and consistent with this transition of uh, you know, metaphorical stagehands on the th in the theater of society from, um, from, from economic entrepreneurs to political entrepreneurs, um, in Wagner's works, it seems to me that dramatic performances are more frequently associated with political activity so essentially we have uh, social tectonics, drama, suspense, conflict that arise from tr triadic network entanglements that generate uh, a range of animosities. And of course, uh, Wagner draws upon uh, sort of a Paratian sociology uh, to indicate that 
uh, that um, that political actors engage in a lot of um, we'll call it emotional labor, affective work uh, to try to soothe uh, the, the, the the sort of the sharpest disagreements and pains uh, that result from tragic arrangements where you know, by by definition there are win win lose configurations that are orchestrated uh, in the uh, the the grand entangled networks of society. So uh, e even that in itself, uh, this the, the 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 use of ideological sentiment and rhetoric uh, to try to uh, to try to soften uh, sort of disagreements uh, can bear dramatic qualities. And I hope to uh, so I hope to illustrate that uh, in a in a moment. Um, and I also want to mention that um, uh, that Wagner correctly uh, indicates that communication is also critical. Uh, the articulation on logical sentiments, as well as the usage of props and symbols. Uh, Wagner refers uh, to uh, advertising, uh, not only in his 2010 book, but elsewhere as well. So, uh, so as I've indicated before, so the dramatic uh, sort of element of human interaction involves uh, so, you know, a combination of physical gesturing that you know people can resonate with uh, involves uh, communication, involves discourses that per potentially persuade, and also uh, rely upon the usage of uh, symbols uh, and various props, uh, which um, uh, which try to connect uh, with um, people's understandings of tradition or uh, the, the the broad sort of social, or to try to tap in. Uh, to the uh, existing cultural social milieu. Okay, crisis. Um, so it, it is argued by some scholars uh, that uh, we moderns are presently gripped um, by and um, emburdened by living in a so-called period of crisis. So we've had the GFC, we've had, we have climate change, we have a pandemic, uh, we have terrorism, uh, we have, you know, lots of, um, you know, social, economic and political problems. Uh, we might very well have, we have we've had uh, looming, so we have had crises in terms of sovereign debt. Uh, it's likely, regrettably, uh, for me to say that um, many in the West are probably likely to experience soon uh, a, a, a crisis and drama attached to uh, severely spiking price inflation. Uh, and ongoing supply issues. So um, it seems very clear to me that crisis periods are associated with potentially transformative structural changes in entangled political economy. Uh, I, I should, um, it would be remiss of me to, um, uh, to uh, uh, not mention uh, recent uh, scholarship by Dick and also by Marta uh, with respect to, uh, with respect to an entangled political economy approach towards understanding the COVID-19 pandemic, which I believe uh, encapsulates uh, a lot of the sort of dynamics that I seek to discuss now. Um, so a crisis period uh, may be um, all other things being equal associated with tightening connections between certain economic and political enterprises. We see again, this sort of continual, uh, continual pattern of a transference of stagehand positionality in favor of political actors who now tend to rule the roost in terms of uh, economic um, orderings and all the problematics that associate with that, knowledge and incentive problems, of course. And then um, the crisis periods are also associated with uh, empirical correlations with the rationing growth in size and scope of government. I refer here specifically to uh, the seminal work of Alan, uh, Alan Peacock and Jack uh, Wiseman, uh, referring to the ratchet effect of governmental expenditure uh, in the United Kingdom during the 20th century, which are, uh, basically correlate with um, war, war episodes. And of course, um, the, the very famous work by Robert Higgs, uh, Crisis and Leviathan, uh, referring to the, the same kind of mechanisms at, at play so I'm arguing in my paper that political actors use dramatic performances and techniques to try to solidify authority during crises and to seek to legitimize growing political influence within the connective framework of interaction 
Uh, one sort of example of this sort of drama, uh, it, it, I refer again to the COVID-19 pandemic, certainly in Australia, um, many of the sort of the uh, uh, state premiers and chief ministers would have obligatory 11 a.m. or 11.45 a.m. press conferences to uh, enlighten the population about case numbers, um, as small as they might be. But nonetheless, uh, th there was always sort of a sense of drama attached uh, to, uh, to these uh, sort of announcement performances, okay? And, and we'd also had seen uh, during the global financial crisis in ways which are very neatly covered in um, the Adam Smith, uh, uh, Dick Wagner and um, um, Yandel uh, paper in 2011, Public Choice. Uh, the, the sort of the, the legislative drama, the regulatory drama that took place during the height, uh, during the peak of the 2007-08 global financial crisis. Uh, with interactions between Bernanke and Hank Paulson and, and whatnot, uh, and their interactions with the legislators. And all of that um, embodies a sort of dramatic quality as, as well. So we're thinking about um, drama, the, 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 the drama of crisis. Um, I refer to some techniques um, that, in, that are used in crisis situations. So we, we think about dramatic language, Right. For example, if our policy is not carried, then uh, the, the society will collapse or, or whatnot. Um, and this dramatic language is actually curiously interspersed in a good cop, bad cop way uh, with um, oftentimes the rationalistic speech of policy, modelling, legislative consideration and, and whatnot. So what that what all that merely suggests to me is not a contradiction in uh, this sort of framework, but uh, essentially, um, the adaptability of political actors in uh, trying to attend to different audiences at once. So perhaps some of the dramatic language for people who, um, you know, who in their ordinary lives are not, not too concerned about uh, everyday politics, um, as opposed to the rationalistic sort of language which attends to, uh, you know, various uh, sort of business interest groups, um, uh, other legislators, bureaucrats, and whatnot. Um, in addition to the use of dramatic language, uh, crisis periods are synonymous with the oftentimes the use of familiar political settings, uh, such as a press, a political press conference um, you know, in front of a flag, uh, which serves as a unifying symbol um, that uh, you know the, the nation state will preserve forevermore somehow and also other symbols to confer images of confidence and stability during radically uncertain times. Um, what I don't get into in the, into the working paper, but what I wouldn't mind actually just uh, briefly uh, sort of referring to now uh, is uh, the potential to think about national income accounting statistics and modeling exercises even for uh, COVID-19. And I think about um, the, the, the somewhat notorious um, Imperial College London modelling, which uh, sort of provided, you know, gross overstatements of the number of casualties uh, that were likely to ensue from COVID-19 <coughs> in the first wave um, of the pandemic as, um, as, as dramatic props. Um, I want to, uh, I have a, only a little bit of time left, I imagine. So what I'd like to do, just yeah. briefly. Sorry, um, yeah, 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 with regards to time, we are we are a bit over time. So if you- Okay, so what I'll do, I will just skip to the uh, summary. Thank you very much. So, um, yeah, so, um, so I'm happy, happy to refer to the national income accounting issue uh, later because it is actually used as a dramatic prop. And, um, you know, this is the reason why national income accounts uh, continued to persist for all their limitations, but what not. Uh, but, uh, but regardless of that, I now come to my uh, summary. So I would argue that an understanding of a dramatic element of uh, societal interaction helps give meaning to the observed structure of connections within entangled political economy. Drama, I think, serves the function of attracting attention to actors engaging in performances on the metaphorical societal stage and in some cases can help formulate and solidify new patterns of entanglement, especially post-crisis. Crisis management arguably provides a conspicuous case examples of dramatic elements underpinning 
these interactions and their associated connections. And I would argue in the end that dramaturgy is seen as a feature of heterodox challenges to orthodox, including additive political economy, because it reveals the use of language, materials and settings for creative, sometimes duplicitous and opportunistic displays of human agency. And with all of that said, I thank you for your time. I apologize for running a little bit over time, but I'm, um, I very much welcome the ensuing discussion. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you all, Michaela, for this great, thoughtful uh, presentation. I'm sure we could listen to you uh, much uh, longer, but what but we do want to do um, uh, allow for some questions. So uh, I already see some, some hands uh, that are raised. So uh, I think it's going to be uh, Dick first and then Jordan and, um, and Cameron. Okay, so Dick, go ahead, please. Okay, I would like to go on your really fine presentation uh, Michaela, to offer one kind of demurro from your presentation, which is I do not think in terms of metaphor, uh, not at all, but rather think of the cosmic drama image that I've worked with as real. It is what it is that uh, humans uh, create themselves. They, uh, now they do have certain kinds of patterns of similarities in the concerns they have. This was, there was a lovely book by Hadley Cantrell going back to the 1960s. He was a psychiatrist called The Pattern of Human Concerns. And it was, uh, uh, some interesting things that I think you would find. I don't look upon this at all as just a metaphorical image, but in fact, what you have are people uh, coming into life uh, all the time and they face the questions we all face. What are we gonna do with ourselves? How are we gonna occupy ourselves? Um, now, sir, there are some similarities in how people throughout the world occupy themselves because there are certain similarities in our fundamental natures that require attention, that uh, we, uh, we need to have food regularly to keep us going, water. None. We don't like to get overly cold and all these things. We don't like to get lonely. All these things work to create a certain commonality to the attention of the species, which was what Cantrell talked about in the pattern of human concerns. Although he also uh, was very contrary to economists in the sense that he allowed uh, uh, perceptions to be reality forming and not just to be about an independent reality. So he was in a very different way of thinking, and I think much more useful for my image. Uh, but it's, I take it then that uh, we each as humans have teleology, but the society, this drama is, where it's going to go is where these interactions among all these people are going to take it. And I think it happens to be that uh, politicians are a set of people who, whose identity depends on trying to sell a particular teleological image, uh, uh, but that's that's as far as I would carry the uh, teleology or, or the metaphor. I mean, I, I just say we are all uh, actors in this cosmic drama. We have no choice about it. And we, in turn, we uh, try to create the kinds of parts and places and all that that interest us, make life interesting to us, and, and all of these things. Okay, no, thank you very much. I, I, I value that. And I'm 
I'm glad that my paper is a working paper because I can refine it. <laughs> um, no, no, no. I, look, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm very happy that you're here, and I, I think the, the the sort of large reason for that is that um, you're able to clarify for me, as you have, uh, so your sort of understanding of uh, your own use of of, of this kind of uh, sort of framework. So. Uh, certainly, uh, the debates about metaphor versus uh, literality uh, is uh, sort of very widespread in the literature, which I tap into, and certainly uh, my my sort of presentation reflects that. Um, though I think I can I can successfully sort of sidestep uh, that by taking on board um, your, your 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 comments, and and um, you know they're very helpful. And I wasn't I wasn't aware either of the the Cantrell. Uh, sort of study. So thank you. I, I'm I very much appreciative of that. Thank you very much. Hey, uh, and I see um, Jordan next on the on the list on the queue. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation, Michaela. Um, I'm a little bit curious about the ties between drama in modern economics and politics that you've been talking about and the role of rhetoric in McCloskey's work. I saw that you um, cited her a couple of times, uh, but it wasn't it wasn't super deep. And so I'm just wondering how you see like, okay, yeah, obviously institutions matter, but thoughts, culture, and rhetoric also matter. How do you see your arguments on drama dovetailing with McCloskey's arguments on kind of rhetoric and the role of rhetoric in economic life? Um, I, I see them as very neatly and very tightly connected, uh, to, to be honest with you. Um, I think, uh, you know, it, the, the impression of perhaps my limited uh, engagement with McCloskey in the working paper is just a reflection of uh, the fact that I probably had some uh, other uh, underlying motivations in mind in preparing that particular manuscript, and that is to actually sort of convey what, what I actually mean by by drama and, oh, you know, actually it, it, it actually has a heritage that, you know, links to, you know, Adam Smith and so on. So, you know, you know uh, uh, economic uh, liberals, for example, can usefully engage with this. Um, I, do, I do also refer to, and I'm, I'm a big fan of uh, this piece of work. Um, there's a chapter in um, uh, Hebert and Thomas's um, recent book uh, emergence, Entanglement, Political Economy, I hope I got the title right, uh, a chapter by um, Adam Martian about uh, uh, talkative political economy. I'm a big fan of this uh, paper, uh, actually, and I wish I could have used it uh, quite a lot more. Um, so I, I think that, um, I think in the end, this working paper, this provocation paper of mine's a draft thing. It's not the final word. Uh, and indeed, you know, the sort of comments that Dick has made and you, you have now made sort of indicates to me even more that uh, there's probably a multi-part um, output <laughs> agenda here, but I'm, I'm, I'm very, um, very partial uh, to McCloskey's um, ideas. <laughs> um, yeah, just to, uh, yeah, to let you know. Great, thank you. Yeah. All right, then uh, now Cameron and then Roger. So Cameron. Hi. So thank you for the, the presentation. Uh, so my question, I, I'm trying to wrap my head around the work that this concept of drama is doing. So my impression of what you're trying to do is to draw attention to the fact that people are susceptible to affective and symbolic speech, and that therefore there's a performative aspect to human interaction. And you also want to criticize orthodox economics for failing to appreciate this, right? That's now, I, I agree with this. And I think that what you point to as important is important, but I'm never quite satisfied with arguments that stem from, I observe this is important. And these people don't think this is important because you know uh, an orthodox economist is going to look at the same things you do, and they're going to acknowledge all the bare facts of the matter, and they're just going to say, you know, that's you know that's unimportant, that's incidental, that's deviations from what's really important, which is going to be the rational actor model. So what do we do? Are we just at a pure impasse here, or how do we? Or maybe what I'm asking for is like, why are people susceptible to 
affective and symbolic speech. Yes, and, and this, this would uh, attend to a range of you know, socio-psychological sort of factors, which I'd probably uh, regarded my paper as a little bit out of scope, but will need some attention somewhere, somehow. Um, and I, I, I still sort of mull over this issue uh, in terms of uh, engagement with neoclassical um, economics, because in as much as um, I'm, uh, I'm kind of embracing the spirit of entangled political economies, criticism of neoclassical economics, that is a sort of uh, an impression of a, a denuding of creative human agency, which can then in, then in turn bring in um, the, the, the sort of possibility of uh, sort of, let's say, preference falsification and opportunism and, and so on and so forth. I, I, I should, and I didn't really sufficiently acknowledge, but I, one day I, 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 I certainly would acknowledge that um, neoclassical economists, or certain neoclassical economists will say, actually, in fact, that they actually have engaged uh, in some elements of behaviour that I cover in my paper that has been incorporated in there. So I'm referring in mind specifically to uh, what I was taught uh, during my time as an economics undergrad, uh, and I was a, kind of a big fan of the time, new, new classical economics, you know, sort of the bit of Bob Lucas and all that sort of macro literature in which, you know, they actually refer to policy surprises and, and whatnot. So, you know, to, so in that sense, they, uh, they might actually try to defend themselves and saying, well, actually we do uh, sort of uh, take into account, you know, some uh, temporal or, or aberrant uh, sort of episode of drama to the extent that uh, policy surprises uh, are injected uh, into into political economy uh, as seen by you know sort of shifts in inflation rates or unemployment rates and whatnot. Um, so I, I I think from I think what I'm trying to say here is that um, you know I, I'll need to sort of address uh, that element of the neoclassical enterprise um, um, you know sort of more more uh, uh, not not faithfully but just you know just try to accommodate it. Um, the framework, but I think my my ultimate intention is to try in various ways to uh, sort of extend upon or just to sort of amplify um, many of the sort of themes that I think sort of drama entails in uh, sort of Wagner's scholarship and an entangled uh, political economy. Um, one, of, one of the things I try to do in this paper is link to um, something that um, Wolf Van Leer, you know, he had a PhD thesis on uh, political economy of crisis entangled political economy perspective. I don't know if Dick, you maybe might might have been on his uh, sort of supervisory panel. Perhaps it was a lovely it was a lovely thesis. Um, there hasn't uh, and aside from the you know the Smith Wagner Yandall paper and the recent papers on COVID, um, I feel that there needs to be sort of uh, you know additional engagement and this these kind of this caliber of human interaction. I hope I've been able to answer your question uh, sufficiently well. <laughs> yes, thank you. I am uh, actually going to um, use my privileges as, a, as a, organizing the discussion to, to jump in on that question because it's a, it's an important question, uh, Cameron. And uh, we, um, I, I think um, possibly it goes back to the nature of knowledge, right? So if uh, you are an orthodox economist, you think that either everyone knows every, the same things or at least you know what the other person doesn't know, right? Sort of the asymmetric information. Not much to talk about, right? Like if, if we have that common pool of knowledge that we that closely overlaps. But if you have um, pools of knowledge that are very uh, different, right? If I don't know what you know, and I don't know your perspective, your preferences and so on, then talk is necessary, right? And then we fool each other in an ongoing way with all this dramatization. And uh, the thing that really stood out to me from the presentation, I mean, there was a lot, but the this notion of data as a prop, as a dramatization prop, right? Like, uh, I think that's, um, that's sort of um, a useful tool if you um, if you have a, this dispersed knowledge and no way of knowing where the overlaps in, in knowledge of different individuals, different interacting individuals are. So anyway, that's that's just my comment. Um, but next on the list, we, we have Roger. Uh, so I'm gonna... Uh, 
Okay, hi. I hope this works. Am I? Can I be understood when I speak like this? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. 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 All right. You know they'll arrest me and take me to Google if I take off my mask here in the airport. Um. So this is great. I think it's wonderful. I, Michaela, I don't know what to do with your working paper because that's a sort of finite uh, product. But I, I, you know, but it connects just in so many different directions. Uh, I, I think I think one of the directions to, to point and uh, Marta maybe was getting at, um, you know, this this whole idea that uh, this sort of, sort of quote unquote neoclassical model of rationality uh, that so dominates that it, it, it insinuates itself into our thinking when we don't even know what's doing. So a great answer though is, is the work of this guy, uh, co-author of mine, I probably said, Seppo Feline, F-E-L-I-N. Yeah, this stuff on the all-seeing eye. So, so if you just type in, you know, Feline, F-E-L-I-N, and then the phrase all-seeing eye, I think it's six hyphens in there. Um, he really deeply makes the point um, uh, that uh, you know that we, we live in the, what William James called the, uh, the many worlds, or what Schutz called the multiple realities, and and uh, sort of standard orthodox economic approaches elevate one view as 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 God's eye view, and there and, and, and Herbert Time is quite explicit about that. Construe um, is the boundedly rational agents, you know, uh, heuristics and so on as approximations to this divine uh, one true objective model. And, and, and I think Phelan and his, his co-authors just tear that apart. Uh, and they, they go back to this uh, guy, Uxku, who wrote Forays into the Worlds of Animals or something like that. Fabulous, very finite book. So if you, if you then take the next step and read Uxku, I think it's highly clarifying. There are these results that, you know, if, if people have the wrong kind of lesion in their brain and lose emotion, they can't make the most trivial rational decision. So the whole idea of like rationality and emotion is this two different entities. We are always in, it's wrong. We are always instead in the position of origin and past, right? Who can't decide whether to go left to that bail of hay or right to the other bail of hay. We must always just break off the, the, the process of ratiocination and act. And it is emotion that allows us to do that. So, so, so emotion is constitutive of rationality rather being, than being a compromise of rationality. And I think um, if, if you sort of make that switch, make that more explicit and everything like that, then suddenly the, the idea of drama uh, becomes, I think, more natural and less about any sort of deviation from people being, you know, people being duped or any of this kind of stuff like that. Um, so, and then one last only thing, and then I'll be quiet. Uh, the, the one name I didn't hear, forgive me if it's in your working paper and I missed it, the very important name, Darwin. I, I think we totally, yeah, so, so we totally got to take, you know, an evolutionary Darwinian point of view, you know, evolution of morality, and all stuff like that, the evolution of the, you know, Smith didn't have Darwin, right? Um, so I just, you know, that would just happen along in your working paper, heavens, I don't know. But but the, the sort of larger project, I'm more thinking about these, you know, that, that stuff I think is very much there. Thank you very much. And um, no, and, and thank you, uh, Roger, for those uh, fine uh, suggestions. I'm certainly uh, sort of familiar with, um, um, your, your sort of collaborative work with uh, Teppo and Stuart Kaufman and the like, which, you know, give rise to complex combinatorial sort of understandings of um, <clears throat> economic in interactivity, uh, when, you know, perhaps in which uh, sort of drama could play uh, some role. Uh, and uh, certainly, you know, you know, a mention of the, the obvious uh, Darwin. Uh, no, and, and your mentioning of uh, Darwin reminds me actually of... Um, um, you know, some very helpful work by the late, great uh, Jerry Gauss. Uh, I think he uh, wrote a, co-authored a chapter with uh, John Thrasher about uh, the evolution of uh, morality of sort of social moral evolution, uh, which, um, yeah, which I uh, really ought to take into account as well. Thank you for your advice. <clears throat> All righty, and now, um, uh, Dirk, if you would like to, uh, I see on the list somewhere. Yeah. Uh, something that Cameron said there uh, that Marta and Roger picked up on as well is one thing that 
uh, strikes me as really interesting and peculiar is what I wonder what you would think of. It seems to me is that economic theory has emerged into an inherently feudalistic oriented discipline in the sense that it, through its internal theoretical developments, has constructed a two-part feudal style society. There's a set of people who are just do what they do, who are the object incorporated into their theories. And then there is the governing class of which e economics serves as the vehicle for instructing the governing class what to tell the few lords. And I think what, uh, what you're trying to do with drama uh, or cosmic drama, if you will, whatever, is really trying to say that everybody matters. Uh, it's because they don't matter in economic theory. In economic theory, the only people, see, ordinary people create the data, which then the economic manipulate, however you want to put it. Uh, whereas in the alternative, everybody is alive doing things and their dreams, their plans, their activities, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all. Uh, all figure in, and uh, you know I, I I'm intrigued and, and uh, I I don't know if I uh, really believe what I just said. I think I do, uh, but but I I think there's something about uh, the dehumanizing form of orthodox economic theory in the sense that uh, most people don't. Federal Reserve chief gets it right. If so and so gets it right, you get a president who comes out and says, "Well, we're in a mess, but if you do what I want to do, we're going to be okay." That is disgusting, thoroughly. I think, besides being stupid, even worse than disgusting, it's downright stupid because there's nothing in the way that societies work. Uh, that would allow any of that to come to pass. And so, you know, I think that's why this dramatological uh, movement, I think, I think where it's really capable of heading, I think, is uh, erasing the neoclassical time in economics and bringing us back to Adam Smith, David Hume, and all those characters. Uh, yes, so th th thank you again, uh, Dick, for those perceptive comments. I I, I thoroughly agree, and um, uh, one one uh, sort of aspect of the the working paper that I kind of left a little understudied, but I'm I'm very animated about is actually um, the the use of uh, sort of the, I, I guess the inappropriate use of uh, national income accounting and its sort of anthropomorphic sort of portrayal as something that is manipulable, right, by uh, the shell game of, of policy. And so it, it, it was really only after um, the, the, sort of my preparation of the, this provocation paper that I, um, you know, sort of come to increasingly sort of understand or appreciate that um, you, you sort of, um, you know, you've engaged quite exhaustively in uh, in uh, sort of systems theory and basically trying to, uh, I, I guess, dispel the sort of the, the follies of this sort of anthropomorphic, you know, in, independently autonomous macro sort of system interpretation um, of the economy as exuded by uh, national income accounting aggregates. And it, uh, I think my realisation after reading paper is that, well, actually, um, you know, so what sustains national income accounting uh, in its sort of and its political use in its present form, um, you know, for all the limitations, and I've written my own things, sort of, you know, critiquing national income accounting, especially the treatment of the G term uh, in, uh, you know, in uh, national income um, accounts. And I think um, my my basic conclusion is that uh, for all the drawbacks and limitations of national income accounting, 
it provides dramaturgical value for those who um, are advantaged by it. Uh, and that's certainly the political classes, as you've said, you know, and, you, and you've said in your own terms that, um, you know, a, a politician will, you know, stride onto the stage right, at a press conference or in front of the, the legislative assembly and, you know, wave about, uh, you know, some sort of confected modeling exercise and say, well, um, you know, follow this, um, everyone, marshal, get marshaled, right, your turn, uh, you know, get marshaled into this, uh, get regimented into this sort of patterned activity, everything will be fine. Uh, and I think it, uh, again, it's a, uh, it's a, 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 a sort of a, a dr dramaturgic presentation of a sort of policy that really doesn't get to the core of um, the, the fact that um, economies uh, sort of persist and flourish by virtue of these micro level um, actions. And even those micro level actions have their own uh, dramatic uh, qualities, you know, going to a bank and having to persuade someone to give you a loan, for example. Um, no, so th thank you. Thank you for the comment. Um, that, I think that's very helpful. Excellent. And uh, I think, uh, Roger, uh, you want to jump in? So uh, let's do that. And yeah, if I may. Um, Boyd had stuff about the dramatological function of national income accounting is fabulous and mind blowing. So I love this comment. Dick, I, I think you're, you're right. You, you expressed some doubt about this kind of belief versus, you know, this kind of feudal vision. But I, I don't think you should, um, I, at least in, at the basic level of vision. I think it's right. I think that, you know, the state space model of orthodox economics um, utterly mortified. And this, you know, idea of this, like we've got the godlike point of view, and then, you know, people are just trying to get, get in sync with that. Uh, they're trying to get good with that, you know, uh, get right with that. So, I mean, I, I think that absolutely mortifies the autonomy, the creativity, um, and the rationality of the uh, intelligence of the agents within the system. We're above the system, they're in the system. And, and, and there's, they're, they're missing that actually they are themselves in the system, not above the system. Now, uh, Morgan Stern gave us a great way to kind of work through the sort of logic and the problem of that. In, in his theory is in a discussion of theory absorption. He asks us to imagine a, theory, a society where there's no economics. And then economists come along, they study that society and they make the economics for that society. But then uh, that theory, level one theory, call it, leaks into the society. People read the theory, they learn about it. That changes their behavior. So now we need level two economics. But level two economics will enter the society, change the behavior. Right? Now, uh, rational expectations just assumes that that sequence right, culminates at level infinity, by the way, without a process. Okay? Uh, uh, Morgan Stern was wiser and asked, you know, what's the, what's the order structure for these theories, right? Does it culminate in a maximum or is there cycling or what happens? And I, I think that's, um, that's just a framework, but it's a framework for getting at um, the, the error in the, the, the elitist point of view that you take just out, outlined, I think, uh, correctly. Yes, and uh, no, and, and thank you again uh, for those uh, additional uh, sets of comments. And, and it seems to sort of key in, if I can use a Goffman term, keying. Um, I think your comments sort of key into, uh, you know, a, a sort of strand of uh, social scientific literature of, which refer to the sort of, you know, performativity of uh, sort of human activity, including uh, sort of economic activity. And so you get these figures like, uh, even Judith Butler sort of talks about, you know, the performativity of economic activity and Mark Callan and the like, you know, sort of talk, you know, very directly to the phenomena that you refer to, uh, Sir Roger, and that, you know, people learn, uh, you know, the, the model, let's say neoclassical rational actor model, and, uh, you know, then they will engage in behaviours which are consistent um, with that. So, I, and, and, and thank you for the uh, mention of uh, Morgan Stern as well. Uh, which I'll uh, will follow up. Thank you. Uh, excellent. Uh, so I don't see any uh, more uh, 
raised uh, hands. If anyone, we still have, uh, we actually have just a couple minutes. So uh, I think we could do one short question even if that comes up, but uh, otherwise, um, Michaela, is there uh, anything you would like to uh, conclude with or add, or I, I know I interrupted you and didn't let you finish. Uh, so if there is anything you wanna um, say. No, I made, I made the elemental point I wanted to make about national income accounting in the response to questions. I, I think that, um, you know, um, uh, specifically just and to, to repeat uh, my perception as to why uh, the, so this, this, you know, inappropriate sort of macro uh, system sort of utilization of national income accounts persist is that it provides dramatic uh, sort of value, you know, for those who uh, sort of purvey them. But um, look, I, I, I would like to uh, sincerely thank um, everyone, uh, all the commenters, all the, all the attendees for uh, sort of, you know, providing, you know, useful insight and information, which will uh, no doubt sort of helped me sort of refine uh, this research agenda um, in, in varied uh, ways, extremely valuable. And I'm very appreciative of everyone's uh, time and attendance. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much uh, for, for sharing uh, your paper with us and uh, for the excellent uh, discussion. Uh, it's, um, I always walk away from these uh, conversations with, with, oh, sorry, Roger, no. No, I was just clapping. Was just saying, yeah. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> yes, so thank you. Uh, excellent job, Michaela. And uh, see you in a, in a couple of weeks. Yes, we'll be meeting again in, in December. So thank you all. Bye. See everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks for your time. <laughs>